Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Firewalls Don't Stop Dragons. I'm your host, as always, Kerry Parker, and we've got a wonderful, wonderful interview show for you today. Something I have literally been trying to put together for, gosh, it's got to be over two years now. Uh, I've been trying so hard to find some expert on dark patterns to come on the show. In fact, I've one of the first persons I, I reached out to was, I guess, the kind of the, the father of the term and never heard back from him. We're going to hear his name today in, in the show. And, and some other folks as well from other universities, actually. But I came across a paper by some folks at Purdue University. And so being my alma mater, I thought that would be a great place to reach out to and see if I could get one of those folks to come on the show. And I succeeded. Today we'll be talking with Dr. Colin Gray from Purdue University, who with some of his colleagues has created uh, several papers. The one we're going to focus on today was one for a couple of years ago. But it's about dark patterns. And they really went to the trouble of breaking it all down and explaining what it is. We're going to get into that today. But that topic has just fascinated me for a long time. And in case you don't recall, and we'll get into this in the show, but this is all the different ways that websites, in particular phone apps, have tricked us into doing things that we don't want to do, but they want us to do. And there's so many different ways, and they've actually come up with a complete taxonomy of terms that explain the various ways that they're doing this to trick us. And as we're going through this, just keep in mind that this was completely deliberate. This, this has gone beyond, you know, clever marketing. This has gone beyond someone saying, well, but we could get more people to sign up for our service if we did this. This is actually people understanding the human psyche well enough to use that against us. And, you know, if you watch the movie Social Dilemma, which I've been pushing and which actually uh, our guest today will also mention... It really shows you what lengths that we've gone to as a society or as a capitalist society to earn that extra little bit more money and to do that much better than our competitors at keeping our attention, at making us spend more money, at tricking us into giving away even more of our personal information, which on the back end they will turn around and monetize. So anyway, I find it fascinating, as you could probably tell. I hope you find it just as fascinating as I do. Uh, and we really get into some interesting aspects to this and what it means to us and how we can combat these things, how we can recognize these things, and whether or not we need regulation, for example, to curb these activities. Because it's it's just not a fair fight. It just, it just really isn't. These guys have gotten so, so good at what they do that the average person just, frankly, doesn't stand a chance. So anyway, we're going to get into that shortly with Dr. Colin Gray. A couple quick important news items. I know it's going to be a little while before I do another news show. Uh, this will be a two-part interview as usual. And uh, after that, we'll do a news show. But, uh, you know, I don't want to wait that long for a couple of these things. First of all, again, there's been some really bad Windows bugs reported, even different ones than what I talked about last week. So you definitely want to be updating your Windows. I know there's been some glitches with that, so be careful. If you know enough about Windows, you you know make sure you want to do a you might want to do a restore point before you do it. I think actually Windows now does that automatically. Uh, make sure your data is backed up and that sort of thing. But the the bugs are bad uh, and can be exploited and are actively being exploited. So you want to make sure that you keep your Windows up to date. That is also true for Chrome browser. There have been even newer horrible bugs found in the Chrome browser, uh, and it will keep itself up to date, but in a lot of cases, you have to restart the browser for those to take effect. So make sure you're keeping Chrome up to date as well. That's probably even more crucial than the Windows bugs because uh, these two things are being used in concert, but the Chrome bugs are the ones that could be exploited remotely, as in from anywhere on the planet. Um, so you definitely want to get Chrome updated, keep it updated, or, you know, hey, just switch to Firefox. <laughs> Maybe it's time, right? Not saying Firefox is perfect, uh, but... You know, for better or for worse, since it's not as popular as Chrome, it's not often as targeted as Chrome is from the bad guys. So you can fly under the radar a little bit more. But of course, there's all sorts of better privacy protections built into Firefox. And we want to support that in any way we can. When uh, some company comes out to protect our privacy, they can only survive if we support them. And one more thing, Apple just released a major, major update to its operating system, macOS. The nickname for this update is Big Sur. I would wait on installing that for a little bit. Usually with there's these major releases, I usually, myself, uh, I'll wait at least a week just to make sure there's no major problems with it. And uh, I've actually already read an article that's kind of disturbing. It's kind of a privacy issue with this update, and I really want to see what Apple's response is to this. And I will, of course, talk about that once I get some more information. But for regardless, I would, for other reasons as well, I would just hold off on update, updating to Big Sur for at least a week. 
I'll try to have a, a little more of an update for you for the next podcast. All right, that's it for now. Let's get into our interview with Dr. Colin Gray from Purdue University on Dark Patterns. Dr. Colin M. Gray is an assistant professor at Purdue University Gold Boilers uh, in the Department of Computer Graphics Technology. Uh, his research focuses on the ways in which the pedagogy and practice of designers informs the development of design ability, particularly in relation to ethics, design knowledge, and professional identity information. Dr. Gray, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me on, Kerry. Um, it's my pleasure. And p please feel free to just call me Colin. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. I, I will do that. Um, I've been trying, and I've, as I've told you, I've been trying to find someone to come on the show to talk about dark patterns forever. My audience is probably sick of me saying, I'm trying to get somebody on here to talk about dark patterns and not coming through. Well, we finally come through and what a, you know, it happens to be somebody from my alma mater too. So that's just, that's all the better. Um, so thank you very much for coming. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Uh, but before, before we dive in though, uh, you've had a rather interesting, uh, educational and occupational history. So why don't you just give us a little, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you came to be where you are today. Yeah. So um, if you had told me 10, 15 years ago that I'd be, you know, doing research on ethics, I probably would not have believed you. <laughs> not because I wasn't interested in some of these topics. But um, as you probably know, 15 years ago, ethics was a pretty dry subject. Still, people weren't really talking about te technology ethics in the ways that they are now. People weren't aware. And, you know, these systems hadn't really become ubiquitous yet. Um, so I originally trained as a graphic designer. I did my first two degrees in graphic design, was originally planning on practicing as an art director and did some web development work and some other things, um, but ended up wanting to stick around for some more education. Found myself doing a PhD at Indiana University uh, back in the early 2010s. And it was at that point that actually my technology interest in development started to cross with some of my interests in digital technologies. And I was doing a PhD in instructional systems technology, really thinking about how people learn and how people are educated and how people you know, do that work through technological systems. Um, it was actually while I was there that a master's student in the, their program in human computer interaction uh, was doing his thesis on dark patterns. And it was a new concept. Mm -hmm. I heard of it until that point. And it just struck me as interesting. So I sort of filed that away <laughs> and uh, did a postdoc at Iowa State University focusing on engineering and design education, focusing on ideation practices. And then in 2015, I found myself here at Purdue uh, starting one of the nation's first undergraduate programs in user experience design. And as I was having to assemble all of this curriculum together and really think about what we wanted our program to be focused on, um, ethics and social responsibility and globalization were definitely themes that we were thinking of um, as really important for the practice of user experience design and the design of future technologies. And it's at that point in 2015 when Dark Patterns came back into the, the conversation for me. Um, I wrote my first grant for the National Science Foundation with Dark Patterns as a focus. And as you can see, the work really started in 2017 based off of that and funding work and took me off really in this direction of technology ethics, designer responsibility and social impact more broadly. Wow, and what a, what a perfect kind of blend of background to you know, for this, for, for the work you're doing is, you know, to have the, to kind of have that synergy of, of those various backgrounds and to know both sides of what you come in is perfect. So you did talk about uh, user experience design or what we call UX design. Uh, just real briefly, kind of tell the audience, because I'm familiar with that as a software developer, but my audience probably isn't. So what, when we talk about UX design or user experience design, like what does that field involve? So this is something that I think end users are increasingly familiar with and practitioners of lots of different types are increasingly familiar as well. Um, because of the movement that really happened with the introduction, introduction of the iPhone and this movement towards bring your own device, which helped people in enterprise suddenly become aware of systems that were more consumer friendly, easier to use, more in interesting to use. Mm. And then obviously the, the boom in social media has also done a lot of that work as well to really help people think about not just systems that they have to use to get work done, but systems that they want to use to stay engaged with other people. So, you know, the modern notions of user experience, I think, are pretty foregrounded because we get a lot of choice now of what apps and services we choose to, to use uh, by and large. But the roots of human computer interaction and user experience design go back to the late 1970s, really at that moment where computer scientists were starting to design systems that weren't just for them. Mm -hmm. uh, they were designing systems that other people had to use as well. And so there was this interest among computer scientists and um, cognitive psychologists at the time in really thinking about how do humans work? How do humans learn? How do humans process information? And can we couple that with computer science to create systems that are easier to use? 
And so the roots of UX really are in the 1980s and usability engineering. Um, so sort of that merger of human factors work, which sort of split off into critical systems. And a lot of modern UX practices actually still derive from a lot of that foundational work that was done in the 1980s and in the 1990s. Now, Apple at the time in the 1980s did start talking a little bit about user experience. Mm-hmm. Don Norman really likes to be associated with that term a lot, although it's not clear that it just came from him in the 80s. Uh, but certainly by the late to early the late 20 aughts, we started to see UX emerge as a de facto job title in its own right. Before then, often it was usability engineering, some of these other fields that are sort of somewhat related. But in the early 2010s, we started to see a real convergence towards that point. And people from all over the disciplinary map have careers in UX now. So certainly have you know research focused people. You have lots of graphic designers, um, like in my previous training, that have taken on very visually UI focused kinds of UX jobs. But sort of a cross a cross section of those roles are really all about understanding the user, understanding what they're like and how they make sense of their world, and designing experiences that are hopefully not just usable because usable usability is pretty boring now, but actually divide, defining systems that are interesting and engaging to use that they want to use. Gotcha. All right. Uh, so let's let's get into uh, why we brought you here. So let's talk about dark patterns, and we haven't really defined that yet. So why don't we start with that? Tell us, you know, what is when we talk about dark patterns, what are we referring to, and how did that where that term come from? So there are a couple. So the the idea of dark patterns came from a practitioner and cognitive psychology PhD himself, Harry Brignall from the United Kingdom, and he coined this term in 2010, um, really leveraging some of his work in cognitive psychology, but also uh, okay. his work in UX practice. Now the idea of patterns has a much longer history. So, you know, if you're from a software engineering perspective, you've heard the idea of patterns before, because mm-hmm. there's this notion of software design patterns. Yep. Well, that didn't come from computer science. It actually came from architecture in the mm. design science movement from Christopher Alexander in the 1960s and early 1970s, where they started to try to define, like, if we can figure out what all the elements of a design situation are, then you can figure out all the different combinations of them and you can automate design processes. Well, that didn't really work. (laughs) Chris Alexander, a few years after he developed this taxonomy for architecture, decided it wasn't actually what he wanted it to be. And that movement of design science failed. But, you know, computer scientists picked that up in the 80s. Mm. And they're like, well, we actually have something here that we really like. Because, you know, they were more on that sort of uh, rationalistic side that actually failed the design science movement. And they started to use it to define these um, mechanisms by which you can design or think about components of software engineering that don't solve the problem themselves, but they give you a hint about how you might solve the problem. And so it's that sort of intermediate knowledge that that drives you towards a more concrete solution. So the notion of patterns has been around in the software engineering lexicon for a long time and also in the sort of design lexicon as well. And so when Harry Brignall used the idea of dark patterns, he was using it to define these reusable strategies like heuristics or like best practices or principles and things like that, but that were dark. Dark in the sense that they're evil, but more in the sense that they are hidden, Mm. more in the sense that they're hidden and that they're obscured and that we can't actually see what they are. And so he actually saw dark patterns as a combination of designer intent, which is very important as we get into some of the other questions a little bit later on. So these are intentional things that designers did with the intention of manipulating user behaviors in a certain direction. And it's done in a crafty way. Mm a sneaky way that leverages some principles of human psychology. And so a lot of the early patterns dealt with um, how you can deceive or manipulate through the presentation of visual information or interactive information that encourage people down a path that they might not be fully aware of until after the issue becomes clear. Yeah. And as I was, as I was looking through your paper and, and uh, obviously I've aware of these myself, but it was really great to kind of, I'd, I'd love the way they're all broken down and we're about to get into that. But, you know, as I was reading it and talking and, and looking at these things in terms of software, I, I, to me, I related a lot of these things in the real world to things like, you know, dealing with a car salesman or trying to get out of your gym membership or, you know, going to a casino where they've, where they've done all these really clever mind hacks to keep you gambling right there's no clocks anywhere there's no there's no windows anywhere it's got pleasant smells you don't have to get up from your table they'll bring drinks to you right they they want to keep you there gambling right so that to me those are the kind of hacks that we're talking here but now we're talking in terms of computer stuff so uh one of the things you said in your paper you always, the way you defined it slightly different than way harry brignall did was you had said a specific ethical phenomenon where user value is supplanted in favor of shareholder value 
So I wanted to throw that out there before we get into these examples, because I think that'll, that'll make it clear. So you called out five different strategies for these dark patterns. Uh, and so let's, let's just kind of walk through them. And if you would, you know, give us a few um, examples. Obviously, this is all audio, but you'll have to describe some of the visual aspects. But I don't think people will have a hard time figuring out these ones. <laughs> Once they hear it, they'll go, oh, yeah, yeah I've seen that. Uh, yeah, a lot of these will sound very, very familiar based on the um, user experiences that people have had sort of through their through their life. And there is actually a collection online that's public uh, that includes a lot of the examples we used to create this initial paper in 2018 that you can go to consult to look at some of the visual examples. Yeah, that's sure. wonderful. I'll definitely put that link in the show notes. It's a nice little crowdsourced list of stuff, which is uh, and it, uh, hopefully uh, can people, su- I, I hate to divert right now, but could people submit stuff to that? Like, is, is it truly crowdsourced? Like as people find these things, do you take uh, submissions? We do take submissions. Um, we're a little bit behind on adding them. And we actually have a bunch that we have backlog that we need to add from our analysis last year from the asshole design subreddit, because there are a lot of dark patterns that are presented in those artifacts that are shared pretty readily. Gotcha. Okay. So number one, nagging sounds, seems pretty straightforward, but let tell us what that is and how that might present itself as a dark pattern. So nagging is straightforward, but it's honestly the most difficult one to capture because it's a temporarily based phenomenon. Mm. So it's something that happens multiple times, uh, sometimes in a very short period of time, sometimes over a much longer period of time. And so, um, you know, you can think of nagging as just continually asking you to do something that you've already said no to or that you already ignored, where the system keeps on asking you in hopes that the answer might change. Mm. A little five-year-old might. Uh, But it also happens in moments where uh, they're they're trying to analyze your behavior and stick something in at the perfect moment so that, that you're more likely to say yes mm-hmm. because of the positioning of it the next time, whether because the situation has changed, the context has changed, or uh, because uh, they've actually identified like a weak spot. Like <laughs> uh, we know at 10 p.m. that's the perfect time to get that person based off of our user testing. Uh, so we, we see that in lots of different places. Sometimes it is for altruistic purposes, like reminding you you're almost out of disk storage or something mm-hmm. like that. But often there are some hidden motivations as well, like we want you to buy more storage from us. Yeah, I, I've been actually dealing with that today. There's a couple apps I've got on my phone that, you know, they as soon as they come up, like, hey, you liking this app? Rate us now. You know, they keep they keep asking me. There's no option to never ask me again. The only way to not have them ask me again is for me to put a rating on on the thing. Which, as a, as somebody who's got a book and a podcast, I I get it. I I need ratings too. <laughs> um, but nevertheless, as a, a you know, when I'm on the other side of that, when it's when the nag gets really annoying. Definitely. All right. So number two in your list of five strategies, obstruction. And there's a, it seems like there's a few flavors of this one. There are a few flavors. And so Brignall, I didn't really talk about this up front, but when Brignall proposed this, this idea of dark patterns, he didn't just say there are dark patterns. He actually identified a list of types. And there are about 10 of those, 10 or 11 of those types. He actually maintains to this day a hall of shame on <laughs> Twitter and on darkpatterns.org, which is a website that he and some others manage. Um, and so we, one of our initial goals was to really figure out like what's inside those, those initial types and then how can we free frame them as strategies? Because mm-hmm. we really think that these are not just things things that exist out in the world, Mm -hmm. which is how computer science design patterns also present themselves. Like they're just out there. And in fact, these patterns are things that are incorporated into designed artifacts by designers. And so we wanted to make these into strategies. Uh, So the second strategy abstraction is really this moment where you identify what, how something could be simple. And then you actually gear it towards the kinds of outcome that you actually need. And so it's making a process more difficult than it needs to be so that you get the kind of response that you want. So walk through a few examples. Like one of his, I love the name, is the Roach Motel. Like walk through, give us some examples of obstruction. So Roach Motel is this idea that is something that's really easy to do, really difficult to get out of. Um, And so a classic example of this is subscription services, Mm. which have sort of overtaken commerce in the last few years, especially during COVID, I think. Um, And so take something like a meal delivery service where it's really, really easy to sign up, takes just two clicks. But then suddenly, if you want to get out of that subscription, you have to call them on the phone (laughs) and you have to listen to them tell you about all the reasons that you shouldn't discontinue your service. So you're sort of held captive in that moment uh, where you're being obstructed from the specific behavior that you want access to. Sometimes it's simply by rewording things or sticking them in the corner to actually make the evident action, which from a user experience perspective, you want the evident action to always be the one that's going to match the user's mental model. Mm -hmm. And in this case, it's matching the mental model that the the stakeholder wants you to have rather than the one that you actually have. Um, And so this is simple often, 
in making something a little bit more difficult, maybe adding an additional click or two in the process, but it can be really profound in how much that changes uh, user behaviors in the aggregate. Well, another one that uh, that you had in the list was uh, that Brignall had as list was price comparison prevention, and I haven't run into that often, but I but I have run into it sometimes, and it it's really insidious. It's really nasty. Yeah, and this is this behavior in relation to airlines was eventually mm-hmm. banned in the in the European Union after it was presented as a dark pattern in the early 2010s. Uh, but yeah, just that phenomenon that you can disallow text selection or text copying on a website can have really profound implications for being able to like copy and paste a a book name or an item name and then put it into another e-commerce search. And disallowing that actually um, obstructs a lot of the other behaviors from happening. Well, I remember the way the way that used to function in the real world was, you know, back in the days when we didn't have quite as much Internet access, we relied on consumer reports or things like that. Uh, you'd want to go compare refrigerators or microwave ovens or whatever. So you'd go into Sears and you say, oh, I like that one. I want to see what, you know, if someone else has that same model at the you know, same price. And so you'd get the, the model number, right? Surely that's going to be universal, but it's not like that. It's the same that's- model that they sell at Best Buy or at some other appliance store, but they've made a deal with the manufacturer to give them a specific model number that makes it different. So, you, so you're so you not sure if you compare apples to apples. Yeah, definitely. Uh, this is just the same version of the, this the similar version of the same behavior, just in an online space. Yeah, these kinds of behaviors have been going on in marketing for a very, very long time. All right. Number three on your list is sneaking. Uh, and there's a few flavors of that as well. So walk us through a few of those examples. So sneaking, think of it as a, a less uh, recognizable form of obstruction because it's still definitely that you're being steered towards certain kinds of behaviors, but it's more along like steering, nudging, trying to move you around a little bit on the, on the track without Mm. actually making you feel like, Oh, I'm being like, I'm being actively dissuaded from doing something. And so it's this hiding, disguising or delaying the divulging of information that would actually be relevant to making a decision. Um, And so these could be things like, waiting until later in the e-commerce process to to tell you, oh, actually it's more, they're shipping and handling attached. Mm -hmm. Or uh, telling you, oh, you'll get this thing for free. And then telling you later, you'll only get it for free if you sign up for a trial that will convert into a full service. And so it isn't, it's like telling a half truth. Mm. Often the full truth is, it comes up, but it only comes up later on in the process after you've already Mm -hmm. gone down that path. Now, one of the subtypes of this was Brignall called forced continuity. What, what's a, what was that about? So forced continuity is um, dealing with uh, some of what we already talked about in relation to those subscription plans, mm-hmm. where once you sort of get there, it's actually very difficult to get out mm-hmm. of, of those situations. So this is like where you might set up a trial, and then it automatically converts into a full subscription. And unless you're really vigilant about watching your bank statements, and you really w- made sure that you read all the fine print, hmm. you often find yourselves paying for several months of a, of a service that you didn't really intend to do otherwise. And often this comes through sneaking. It's not that you know, they're being completely deceptive. Often it's there, like the asterisk down at the bottom hmm. of the page, often in a lighter color than it should be. Right. Uh, but, but it's that sneaking that actually enables them to get ROI on that prospect in a way that's probably pretty unethical. Right. That's like, you know, all that you were talking about the subscription services, you know, all those things when you sign up for something, if you sign up for a free service, but they still require you to give a credit card, that's usually a good sign that if you don't stop doing it, but at the end of the trial, they're going to keep, they're going to keep charging you. Absolutely. Yeah. And this kind of behavior was really common in the United States in particular around like home mortgages and around Mm. credit cards. And you actually saw some big reforms in the last 10 to 15 years in both of those spaces where they had required language and even in some cases like required font sizes Mm -hmm. to make it much more evident what you were signing up for and what you weren't signing up for. And so we've seen some good practical reforms in some other areas, but definitely hasn't come to the digital space yet in the same kind of way. Right. All right. Fourth on your list is interface interference. What's that all about? This is the the big category. Mm-hmm. And it's the big category because these dark patterns, as Brignall originally defined them, are very user interfaces focused. It doesn't mm-hmm. mean that dark patterns can only happen use, through the user interfaces, but it's definitely the easiest to capture with like a screenshot. And that's how most of these dark, dark patterns practices have been shared historically mm-hmm. on Reddit, on the Hall of Shame, et cetera. And you definitely see that in the examples that we have in our in our collection online. And so interface interference, inter- interference, think of it as any manipulation of the visual space using gestalt principles of psychology or other things that we know about visual perception to uh, 
steer users' interaction in certain directions or to make something more difficult than it needs to be. Uh, and so I'll give you a few examples. Uh, so you can play this out from a, like an information architecture perspective by taking something that probably should be a radio button and make it a, a checkbox. Or you can take things that are actually not in parallel as responses, and you can make them all look like they're in parallel. And mm -hmm. so you can uh, dis encourage certain responses and discourage others there. Uh, you also see a lot of verbal examples. So you see this like with the common notion of confirm shaming, which isn't listed here, but certainly fits under this category, where they try to use emotional language to encourage you oh, to do yeah. something. Like, you'd be a fool if you didn't sign up for our email marketing. <laughs> um, that's another form of interface interference. It's actually using, instead of saying OK or submit or sign up, they're putting in more emotionally infused language uh, to, try to, to try to mess with you. And so there's the toy right. emotion there. That's a, the, the classic one I always see is like you, you want to sign up for a newsletter and the checkbox is there and we'll talk about it being pre-checked in a second. But the, the language is, no, I don't want to improve my life or no, I don't want to have ads that are tailored to me. It, it, it's, it's phrased in a way that, that makes you think, wait a minute, wait, I, I do kind of want that, don't I? <laughs> right? Yeah, and there's a whole website of confirm, confirm shaming examples. It's gotten increasingly common in the last few years, especially as um, there's been this real shift in the internet markets towards services mm -hmm. and towards people paying, you know, over time instead of paying up front. Right. Uh, and so there is this, and it, it's also just the mo probably one of the most popular growth hacking techniques that people have found some response rate change in, mm -hmm. and so everyone seems to be doing it now. And it is just annoying as heck. Uh, there, there are a couple others in here um, that yeah, um, yeah. one is pre-selection th that you mentioned. And actually, pre-selection has been made illegal in uh, certain contexts, especially mm -hmm. around consent mm -hmm. in the European Union. Again, we're a little bit behind the times in the United States legislating say, against yeah, these kind of things. So, yeah. But yeah. unfortunately, but it's definitely an issue. A uh, false hierarchy yeah. also comes up here where you put something into a hierarchy where people might be choosing to sign on for a service and something else. And they they look um, the same in the interface, but they're actually performing quite different interactions, which mm. again is a, is a UX no-no. Like you don't, yeah. you want things to match their purpose and their intent um, and match those to the user's mental model. And these are cases where they're actually going against best UI, UI and UX guidance to encourage the user to do certain things or to believe certain things that are not true. And that's why they're effective, right? Because, because that's why they're exactly. effective because you, you're, you've come to expect certain behaviors from certain things in the operating system. Like, you know, the, the X at the top right, if I click that, it closes the window. But when, so these guys take advantage of things like that. When you click the X, it does something completely different. Yeah. And, you know, I think another example of that that we definitely see a lot of even to this day is trick questions. Um, often these are instructed as double or triple negatives mm -hmm. or they're organized within some of these other fr uh, framings like false hierarchy where you actually aren't sure whether you're saying yes or no. Right. You know what answer you want, but you don't know how to map that onto the interface choices that are being provided. And it just it sort of gives you the impact of a sleazy used car salesman, yep. unfortunately. All right, last but not least, force action. Uh, this is probably the most aggressive of all of the tactics. And this is essentially requiring you to do something to access or to continue to access certain functionality. We saw this actually quite a bit with the dawn of a lot of web services, like right around you know, 2005 to 2010, where like if you signed up to LinkedIn, one of the things that it would ask you to do immediately is to tell all your closest, dearest friends on your mm -hmm. list all about LinkedIn too. And it made it very difficult, if, if not impossible, to say no to some of those behaviors. Um, and so that's the privacy zuckering that, that Brignall had identified as, in the social pyramid as well to a, to a lesser extent. Uh, but there are lots of examples of this in sort of modern technologies as well, like where you might want certain functionality as part of a service, but you can only get that if you're willing to select certain privacy settings or certain consent settings. Or you might not, you might want to sign up for the service, but just sign up for one month, but you're actually being forced into set, signing up for a continuous subscription with the understanding that you have to reject it later on. And so this is becoming more common, I think, especially because of this move towards software. So you, 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 you threw out the phrase privacy zuckering, and I want to call you back to that. Explain, explain what that is. I know what that means, but explain, explain to the audience what that means, where that came from. So good old Mark Zuckerberg <laughs> is, is, I think, the root of this. And it's essentially, you know, giving away a little bit more of your data and more of your um, the stuff that, that you might find value around than you originally intended. So, you know, think about Facebook, where you give away a little bit of data, 
And then maybe next week you'll give away a little bit more data. Before you know it, they have a really good, sophisticated model about who you are, even though you don't really understand the extent to which they understand you. Right. Uh, so this is a really common tactic, and it's actually, I think, um, one of the most malicious ways that a lot of apps and services use our data in against us without our knowledge these days. And I, this is why I really applaud, you know, uh, legislation like the GDPR in the EU and the, the new CCPA in mm -hmm. California, and really helping people take back control over their data. Because, you know, even though I do work in this space, and I have a lot of you know colleagues who do work in the privacy and data security space, I don't know and understand the extent of data footprint. And so I can't even start to imagine all the different ways that might be used against me. Right. And in really, really, really problematic ways. So uh, I think this is this is probably one of the big areas where there is a lot more work to be done. So advertising has been around in some shape or form forever. I mean, it, 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 for as long as we've had stuff to sell, someone's been trying to advertise something and sell more of it. So it seems like there's some gray area here. Like when does something go from, you know, a clever marketing technique to being a dark pattern? Like, you know, how and where do we, can we draw that line? Yeah, this is one of the big areas where people, they know that they're up against something big and they just don't quite understand what it is. Like we go in the grocery store, especially pre COVID when we didn't have to worry about it. <laughs> right. And, you know, we'd look around and we probably were aware that we're, people are using lots of marketing tricks on us. You know, that there's certain things on the end caps that are right. on sale, certain things that are there designed to catch our eye. And if we know a little bit about grocery stores, we know that maybe a certain shelf space is sold off at a slightly higher cost than right. others uh, to privilege certain brands. All of that sort of considered, we still actually have a lot of control over that situation. We can choose to go into parts of the store that we might be li less likely to visit. Because we have agency, we might just have to remind ourselves a little bit that we have that agency and that we don't have to be sort of trapped by these situations. The other thing that I think a lot of these physical marketing techniques, whether they be print-based media or physical experiences like the grocery store, is that those have been highly optimized systems that have been developed over a long period of time. So if you think about print advertising, you know they figured out these tricks of visual perception over many decades to figure out how to market to the market segments that they cared about and get the message across that they wanted to. And that's you know constantly sort of an evolving strategy as mm -hmm. ad agencies find new ways to advertise to new generations or around different market segments. Same thing's true in physical spaces. You know, some of the old grocery stores tricks don't work anymore and they certainly don't work in delivery services. So they have to find new tricks <laughs> to augment. The problem is with those physical services or print-based services, it's very costly to try new things out. And so if you take like grocery stores, you know, almost all grocery store chains have a, a few stores that are like their demo and try out stores where they try out new right. stuff and figure out, like, does it increase sales behavior? Or does it increase other metrics that we're interested in? And if those end up working out, then they'll spend the millions and millions of dollars to roll it out to their other locations. Well, you know, the unfortunate and fortunate thing about the internet revolution is that it's actually very cheap, if not almost free to do mass customization. And so, you know, even if you just look at the old models of, of advertising within the digital web versus the, you know, highly customized machine learning work that's done now to customize um, people's web experiences on the fly, you can do A-B testing many, many times. Right. Um, in fact, we know, you know, companies like Facebook um, or Google have hundreds, if not thousands of A-B experiments going on all the time. So explain that real quick. I, I know what that means, but the audience probably hasn't heard A-B testing before. What, what does that mean? How does that work? So at the most basic level, it's that you have two different design alternatives. Could be like we want our button to be slightly bluer in this version than this other version. Or it could be that we organize your newsfeed in this slightly different way. And basically, those choices get deployed through the system of users. So if you think about you know Facebook, they have hundreds of millions, if not more than a billion yeah. active users, they mm -hmm. decide, okay, well, this random segment of 20 million users will get this experience and these other 20 million will get this other experience. And when you're dealing with data at that size and scale, you can actually understand a lot of that, how it converts into different kinds of interactions or different kinds of end, end behaviors. And this is most well known, I think, in Facebook through the social contagion experiment, where they realize they could actually alter people's mood mm -hmm. and emotion level based on the kinds of ways their newsfeed was constructed. Pretty evil because this was done yeah. without users' consent or knowledge, and it was only found out later through the 
paper publication process. But this is happening all around us all the time. Even like your smallest, you know, you're even like a mid-sized business who has a well-curated web page. If they have like a lead generation form on their web on their homepage where they want you to sign up for a list, they're probably A/B testing that with yeah. another version to see if slightly different language gets slightly more leads generated. So this happens. But when we start to think about all the different ways these, especially these large tech providers, engage us with different kinds of experiences and can optimize for any behavior they want at very low cost. It's not a fair fight anymore. It's not the fight of, well, the, the company had a million dollars to try out this new physical infrastructure, and they, over lots of time, figured out what the optimized behaviors were. It's that constantly, as soon as we're learning new tricks, they're finding other ways to persuade and manipulate us to do exactly what they want us to do. Well, and that was, and that's going to be a little bit segue into the next question I had for you, but it seems like there's almost like an, an, an ethical responsibility that when you get when you get too good at something, you know, you know, when I, when the advantage becomes too lopsided and that seems to be where things get out of hand. Like for instance, we've got in this country, we've got a lot of internet rules that are built around age. Like you can't target things to kids under 13 because they're just, it's just not fair. It's taking candy from a baby almost literally, right? It's, you know, so they're just not built yet. They don't have the experience yet to resist or even understand that they're, they're being manipulated. So, but even at this level, it sounds like these, these tools are becoming so good and we're spending, we're, you know, we're, we're spending so much time and effort and research, understanding the human psyche and, and how people respond to these things that, it's it's even with full fledged adults, it just doesn't seem like a fair fight. No, and it really isn't. I mean, of course, of course, we can start our policy discussions around like children who really don't have the the capacity as their brains are still very plastic and thinking through these very addictive behaviors that you know trigger these dopamine cycles. But of course, we know, you know, we're a couple days past the election here, and a lot of us have spent time doom scrolling mm -hmm. in ways that are very well curated for us to just continue engaging in those experiences rather than to actually do what we probably need to do is shut off our computer and go outside. <laughs> right. Uh, and so, you know, these are emotional triggers and these are psychological triggers that people know how to how to push. Uh, very, very well. And in fact, you know, the recent Netflix documentary, really problematic in some ways, but I think eye opening for a large portion of the population, the social dilemma yep. is useful in pointing out that these are part of strategies that came out of psychology, mm -hmm. came out of, you know, these goals of manipulation, maybe for a good cause, a good outcome. But we're very quickly weaponized into a to do list of how can you get a little bit more revenue out of your customer base or how can you get people to say yes, just a little bit more than they are right now. Right. Yeah. Putting shareholder value ahead of user value, as you said in your paper. Um, yeah. So here's the flip side of that though. So, <laughs> so playing devil's advocate, we actually often use these same techniques for beneficial things. In fact, a lot of times you'll see these called life hacks, right? You're either doing it to yourself or you're kind of willingly participating in something that kind of, you know, incentivizes you to eat better or to exercise more or, uh, you know, save money or, you know, there's all these little things that we, we, we kind of end up trying to trick ourselves. So some of these techniques can be used for good. <laughs> you know, what do you say to, you know, the, the marketing people that kind of say, yeah, well, we're just, we're doing things that people do anyway. And, and, and it's really not harmful. It's, you know, we're, we're trying to help these user experience, whatever. I mean, they'll, they'll rationalize these things. Right. But yeah. And the, and the, we actually use these things for good as well. Don't we? There is always the potential to use these things for good. And I think that is where BJ Fogg's original work around persuasive principles came out. It was really trying to figure out, like, what are some places where it's actually in the user's best interest to be nudged into doing something that mm. maybe isn't part of their life, but perhaps should be. And perhaps they even want that to be part of their life. So, you know, examples like being healthier or being more socially active mm. or learning new skills. Yeah, Those are all things that I think we could desire and we could attach some persuasive principles to. Uh, the challenge is uh, really thinking about, number one, this balance of user and shareholder value. It's always going to be a balancing act because we live in a capitalist society. Yeah, right. and so there's no way that we're going to get away from this idea of revenue and profit, but at least letting it be a fair fight right. where the user's getting some value and the shareholder's getting <laughs> some value, but that those are not heavily disproportionate. So that's sort of one angle to really think about it from, you know, is this just a tool to manipulate more profit generation only, or is there actually commensurate value on the user side? And do they actually know what they're giving up? 
The other sort of side of that, though, is really thinking of this from a user agency perspective mm -hmm. and from a transparency perspective. Yep. And this is generally where dark patterns fail, Right. Um, where the, even if you apply them in contexts where there is user benefit in mind, if, they're, if it's not transparent about what they're giving up, like their data or like, you know, potential costs of services they, they, they really don't want to subscribe to for the long run, or even these small nudges that actually just make them waste more of their time. That's not transparent. That's a, that's a really big issue because right. then, you know, it's working against some of the, the best interests that the user might have. The other key thing is really thinking of this um, idea of user agency. And so this is really what GDPR and the CCPA yeah. have started to foreground is saying a user or a customer or a consumer should have a choice mm -hmm. and they should have a more choice about what they're saying yes to or about how their data is being used and all these kinds of things. And so the way that 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 user agency plays out can vary because, you know, often, uh, often we do want to be nudged to do something, but we still want to know that we have an out. And often this is where dark patterns fail because they, they start to tunnel us down to a space where we actually lose a lot of that decision-making power. And so being reflective about where agency and transparency fit in, in relation to this balancing of shareholder and stakeholder values is, is really important to consider. Yeah. To, as I was reading through this and, and, and taking, you know, it was really refreshing to see this approach from a scholarly point of view, because for me, it's always just what my personal experiences have been and how it pissed me off when these things happen. But, you know, actually seeing you walk through it and explain it, it became obvious to me that, and usually it does when I think about privacy and whatever, that, that the real issue here is transparency and agency. And if, if I am making an informed choice, then at least it's a choice, but it's when I, it's when I'm not well informed, when I'm, when I'm being tricked whether they think it's for my benefit or not, that doesn't matter. It's it really, the choice should be mine. And I think that, I think you're exactly right. And to me, I think that's where this, that is where I would personally draw the line. Yeah. And I mean, I think the, the modern issue, the contemporary issue that we're sort of struggling with is that even when we do give the user a choice, which I think is always something that we should be doing from a, from an ethical design perspective, often the user isn't well equipped to manage the mm -hmm. complexity of that choice. And yep. it's not because consumers are stupid or any of that. Right. It's just because we're starting to reckon with issues that are far bigger than us with far bigger implications than I think right. we could possibly have them. You know, so I have, you know, several devices in the house here that capture voice. Right. You know, one of them from Apple, I know won't trigger unless it hears the safe word. Right. The other one behind me, this thermostat will. <laughs> Right. Uh, with Amazon service. And so every once in a while, I'll go into the app and I'll see lots of data that I didn't intend for it to collect, but it's collecting anyway. Um, and so, you know, even if I'm really vigilant about checking all that stuff, it gets past me really easily. And people who don't necessarily have the time or bandwidth or knowledge to manage some of that tech infrastructure are definitely disadvantaged in those cases, not because they're unintelligent or uninformed, right. but just because it requires so much effort and energy. Yeah. Um, and so there's actually a communication scholar that's written about this, and she describes this as digital resignation. Where it's hmm. like, I know that I'm being manipulated. I know that I should be probably paying better attention to exactly how my data is being used and what I'm being asked to do and what I might be being steered to do. But I'm just so tired. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I can't worry about everything. And all I want to do is just read, read the damn article behind this consent right. wall. So I'm just going to say yes, even yeah. though I don't want to, because I want to get on with my life. And so this is one of the big challenges of fatigue that we're starting to deal with, especially with the rise of stuff like GDPR, which is just introducing a whole new layer of dark patterns, to be honest. Oh, yeah. And and that's something that I that, that I always irks me uh, Two yeah, two comments for what you said is, is that, you know, a lot of these companies will say, well, we do give you choice. If you if you look around, you'll find the option where you can turn this off. You, you could if you just have to opt out. OK, let's let's say that's true. How many different places would I need to opt out if I just wanted to opt out? Like if I want to protect my privacy it's it's not logistically possible. There's there's thousands now today, literally thousands, and and the privacy policies that I would have to read and interpret and understand to get to the point where I could understand what choice I'm going to make are some of these things are longer than Macbeth. I mean that was a, that, that was a thing I read somewhere that I thought was interesting that compared to the length of books and how long it would take you an hour over an hour and a half to read some of these things just to, you know and, and of course it's legalese. So point one, there's that, and and the second point is and I and I and I talk about this a lot in my classes and in the book is that. I think for a lot of people, first of all, certainly with privacy, we for a long time people didn't understand this. You know what was really going to be the impact of them giving away the privacy that they're giving away. But I think more than just the impact to me personally, because a lot of people say, ah, "I don't care. I mean, I'm I'm boring. There's nothing about me to know." 
but I think what was missed, and I and I think is finally starting to seep into the the, the consciousness of the of the of the people is, it's not just you. It's not about. It's bigger than you, and that's where things like you know the the social dilemma and the, and Cambridge Analytica and all the, the the broader impacts of all of us doing this, how it really brings down everybody and affects all of us. Oh, absolutely, it is everyone, and I think it's a very privileged position to just say. I don't have anything to worry about because essentially your data is being used to model much bigger mm -hmm. structures that have a much bigger potential to actually change our everyday lives in ways that I think we're often just blissfully, blissfully unaware of. Uh, yeah. And, you know, a lot of the movements that have come up, especially, you know, around equity and inclusion, especially in the last year in the United States, have actually foregrounded a lot of the ways in which these data collection mechanisms are, in fact, biased. And they're po oh, political. Right. Sure. And they're often, uh, you know, misogynist. And they're often racist. Mm. Not necessarily because the people that generated those systems were always racist or misogynist or all those things. But those are ways that we... Um, a scholar named uh, Peter Paul Verbeek talks about this as the inscription of values into yeah. the systems that we create. And it's something that we all do. And so if we're not even aware of what values we're inscribing, then we have a lot to figure out. And then often what we're dealing with now is, is looking at these legacy systems like Facebook, which originally started as a way to perv on the hot girls yeah. at the dorm next right. door. And there's a lot inscribed into that system that we have to dismantle and figure out now. And that's a huge challenge in its own right, much less thinking about the next generation of systems that might have privacy by design embedded into it. Yeah, and that's another one. If you haven't watched the movie The Social Network, that's an interesting one to check out to see, you know, it's uh, how, kind of how Facebook came to be. So has, has the UX design community, uh, how are they reacting to the popularization of terms like dark patterns? I mean, it's become a thing, right? And so now I'm in a, they're in a position of, these are the guys doing the the evil work, you know. Do they how how do they take this personally? And and uh, you know, are they do they acknowledge this is even a problem? And you know, what what's the industry of doing about you know the discovery of these dark patterns and the naming of what's going on here? And so ends part one of our interview with Dr. Colin Gray from Purdue University on dark patterns. The next one is even better. We talk about solutions. We talk about ethics and going to get into some of the de deeper issues around this, what we can do, how we can combat these things, and what it might look like going forward from here. Definitely want to tune into that one. You can subscribe to the podcast. That way you make sure you don't miss it. While you're there, I would love for you to drop a really nice review. I've got a few out there now, but it's always good to have recent reviews on there as well. So it's good to have a steady stream of those. If you haven't done it already, now would be a great time to do that. A couple quick things that uh, he talked about in the interview I want to call your attention to. Uh, first of all was the design patterns things he talked about. That was actually... Uh, one of the more fascinating things that I came across as a software engineer, and I'll I'll cop to the fact that I never actually fully read the book completely, <laughs> but it, in my daily job, it was actually discussed quite a bit that I picked up a lot of it on the job, and that was this book called Design Patterns. It's called Design Patterns, Elements of Reusable Object-Oriented Software. It came out in 1984 by a group of four authors collectively known as the Gang of Four. And even if you're not a software engineer, if you're just kind of interested in software kind of as a technology, as a area of science, it's, it's really, I think, fascinating the way they kind of broke down the realm of the problem space for computer science problems into categories. And with like sort of common boilerplate solutions to those, it's just a really interesting way of thinking about how to solve problems. So if you really want to geek out, check that out. You might want to actually look at, there's a, there's a version called head first design patterns. It's maybe a little more approachable than the original gang of four book. There's actually several books on it, but uh, the the one I've seen best reviewed and the one I have that I have not gotten through is called Head First. So there's that. And also he mentioned the social contagion experiment, and that that is very interesting. And it's something that Facebook did a while back and gotten a lot of heat for. There's a lot of articles been written on this. There's one from Cashburn Hill you might check out in Forbes. I put a link to it in the show notes. And it's super creepy, honestly, but it's it's good to know that these things have been going on. It's I don't know that there's anything really to prevent this from happening again other than bad PR and getting caught. And, of course, The Social Dilemma. If you haven't seen that yet, it's on Netflix. It's a good documentary with kind of some, with a little bit of kind of a fictional story laced throughout to drive the points home. But it's in this day and age, I, I think, as we'll find out in the, in the next episode when we talk about some of the solutions here, you know, forewarned is forearmed. And so just understanding how we're being manipulated is a really big step toward curbing that manipulation. 
All right, I've got a lot of great interviews coming up. One thing about being retired, man, I've just had I've had a lot more time to pursue them. So a lot of them in the hopper, a lot of them coming down the pike. So great stuff coming up. Again, if you haven't subscribed already, now would be a great time to do it so you don't miss a single one of them. And we've got the big 200th episode coming up. I'm going to I had called my 100th episode my pod centennial, so I guess this would be my bipod centennial. That sounds weird. If you look at the etymology, it probably doesn't mean <laughs> doesn't mean what it sounds like it should mean, but that'll be coming up. It should air the Monday before New Year's, and I'm going to be lining up some fun stuff there. I've got a great guest lined up. So again, subscribe, and that way you won't miss it. Tell you all your friends, tell your family as well. In that news episode coming up after the second part of this interview, I'll be going over my best and worst gift list ideas for 2020 with the holiday season coming up. And of course, I'll be doing that from a privacy and cybersecurity perspective. So you don't want to miss that. And last but not least, thanks to the person who left a really nice review on my book on Amazon. I could need about 50 more. So <laughs> if you've read the book, even if it was a, you know, even if it was the previous edition of the book, I would really love a review. And uh, you don't actually need to have bought it through Amazon to leave a review. It won't say verified purchase if you didn't, but it will still allow you to leave a review. And you can you can say in the review, uh, I'm you know, it was about the third edition, or I got this as a gift, so or whatever. Even if it, even if you didn't personally buy the book through Amazon, you can still leave a review. And again, that's Firewalls Don't Stop Dragons. Search for it on Amazon. If you go to my website, firewallsdon'tstopdragons.com, of course, you can find a link to it there and my blog, and my newsletter, and several other resources. So check that out as well. All right, that's going to do it for this week. Please stay home as much as you can. And and I think this year, we just need to not have the big family gatherings that we're all used to having, that we all miss. We haven't had a chance to see our loved ones and our family and friends. And we so much want to get together, and this is the time of year when we do that. But it's just it's just too dangerous. COVID cases are going nuts in this country, and also in some places around the world. And... I'm really just worried about what's going to happen if we have a whole bunch of big social gatherings for, you know, Thanksgiving, Christmas, Hanukkah, New Year's. I hate to say it, but hang in there just a little bit longer. The vaccines are coming. But for the sake of, you know, your friends and families and neighbors and all the frontline workers at these hospitals who are already overwhelmed, we just need to stay home. Keep those masks on when you have to go out. Do all the social distancing and and so on. I know, I keep beating that dead horse. But until it gets better, it's something we just need to be painfully aware of. All right, everybody, stay safe out there. Take care. And as always, until next week, don't get caught with your drawbridge down. <laughs>